am so excited. We always try and make sure that we have a new speaker up on stage at every Odd Salon. So next up, for her very first talk on the Odd Salon stage to discuss how much orcas mysteriously resemble humans, which may explain why I like them more than most humans, please welcome Julia Markish. everyone. Hi. So I have to tell you something. I'm single. My mother finds this very hard to believe, but <clears throat> it's true. And um, some say I'm picky, but you know, I don't want some ape. I want someone who is peaceful and confident and cultured. I want someone who's family oriented and emotionally available. I want to them to be intelligent, but also kind of like intuitive, you know? And also, I want someone with a little bit of mystery. <laughs> Isn't that not too much to ask? I don't think so. Huh? No. All right, okay, so this is actually not a talk about my dating life, even though that is also a mystery. Um, <laughs> but what if I told you that all of these descriptors are actually um, directly applicable to an animal that has recently become the most drool-worthy subject of my <laughs> entire existence, um, which is the orca. What if I told you that orcas are one of the most human-like animals on the planet in ways that you haven't even imagined? Yeah, you'd be like, Julia, why don't you just date a fucking orca? And I'm seriously considering it. <coughs> um, anyway, back to the point. In the next few minutes, I propose to blow your hole. I mean, your mind. <laughs> by taking you through these eight orca descriptors, simultaneously elucidating, but also building on the mystery of these amazing animals, um, and making you want to find one and ask, who are you? And also, do you maybe want to go out on a date sometime? <laughs> oh, up to you. OK, ready? Ready? OK, all right. OK, so we're going to get the easy one out of the way first. Because yes, orcas are incredibly um, strong and often violent hunters. But they're not aggressive towards humans. In fact, there have been exactly zero human deaths caused by wild orcas. Zero. Yeah. Captive orcas are a different story, but if you were locked up for half your life in solitary confinement, you probably would be a little aggravated at your captors too. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Um, but in the wild though, killer whales are actually really, really nice to us bipeds. They are. So, peaceful. On the other hand, while they're nice to us, they're <laughs> not so nice to other species. In fact, they're kind of jerks. Um, they're a little bit cruel to their prey. They slap them around with their tails. They chase them around and kind of like draw out the kill a little bit. Um, so that sucks. They, um, sometimes they kill an animal like a penguin or a cute little seal or like this dolphin up here. And then they don't even eat it. <laughs> Jerks, right? Um, and sometimes they, they like come up to a blue whale all like scary like and they scare the crap out of it, but they can't take down a blue whale, so what gives? <laughs> Scientists <laughs> don't know. <laughs> Total mystery. Um, so some have postulated that it's because they just like to have fun, and they can because they're apex predators, and who's going to stop them? Um, some have postulated that it's because they need to keep their skills sharp and whatnot, um, kind of like a military exercise, kind of like saying, I have big guns. Look at my guns. So anyway, they're kind of jerks. <clears throat> but they're cultured jerks. They have culture, according to D David Newart, who wrote this book, which is also up here. Um, they are the only apex predator, aside from us humans, that have culture. Um, 
different groups of orcas have different languages, and even within languages, they have different dialects, they have different hunting rituals and hobbies and habitats and foods, and um, they're so different from one another that they're actually not regarded as a species, they're regarded as a species complex. And as an example, southern resident orcas, which I'll get to in just a second, I'm just gonna put this down. Southern resident orcas have a greeting ceremony that they do. When two groups that haven't seen each other for a long time get together, um, one Smithsonian writer describes it as such. They, quote, line up into opposing rows before tumbling together uh, into a jostling killer whale mosh pit. <laughs> so I never claimed that their culture was refined, but culture nonetheless. Um, but their family life is most certainly refined. Orcas live in matriarchal and matrilineal pods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for those of you who are not woke, um, <laughs> that means <laughs> that they have <laughs> females as their social leaders and also as their genealogical source, basically like, you know, grandmothers. Um, and the pod that you're born into is the pod that you're in for life. So males, they might uh, go and seek out their honey um, in another pod, but then they're gonna come back to their own pod to keep living. So basically, orca calves are born to single mothers who are then supported by their community in raising their kids, which is pretty badass, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, and when a mama dies, adult males actually take it really hard they become socially adrift and actually typically die if they don't find another surrogate uh, dominant mother or dominant female who can uh, act as their mother, which is quite sad. Um, so a much studied example of orca pods are the J, K, and L pods that live in the Salish Sea, which as you can tell is a little yeah. yeah, good job. I didn't even know. <laughs> um, so as their name suggests though, residents are the most connected to a single location of all killer whale types. And that means they're easier to study. So we have a lot of studies on them, but it also means that they're really sensitive to changes in microclimates. And as some of you may be aware, the Southern residents have been in decline in the last several decades. The start in the 1960s and 70s um, was the rampant orca nappings um, that happened in the area that were devastating to the population as well as to the orcas themselves. Um, and as you know, that's how SeaWorld and others got filled, but we won't go there. Um, fucking SeaWorld, maybe we will go there. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Um, but more recently, there have been a lot of other effects of human idiocy like food shortages because they feed on salmon um, that is the Chinook salmon, and Chinook are also equally endangered. Um, and <laughs> delicious, it's true. Um, and then there's also water pollution and oil spills and sound pollution from boats. Um, these are all maps of all of these devastating, horrible things. Maps, yeah, that, that have ships in them. Um, <laughs> Anyway, the point is uh, the J, K, and L pods are down to 74 individuals today in their population, which is the lowest they've been in 30 years, which really sucks. Um, yeah, all oh right, this is the ships, very good. Um, and then, as if the Salish Sea didn't have enough problems as it was, um, in 2016, about almost exactly two years ago, um, the matriarch of the J-Pod passed away. Her name was J2, or Granny, and it is said that she lived somewhere between 65 and 105 years. It's kind of a broad range, but I like to go with 105 myself. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell that that's Granny because of the, 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 the half moon shaped little notch in her um, dorsal fin that was probably put there by a propeller. Okay, and so um, when orcas like Granny die, orcas actually, their pods mourn. And that's because 
uh, because they're so family oriented, they're so empathetic. They're such an empathetic um, species. And this is a picture from just a couple of months ago. This is J35 or Telequa. And she lost her baby and she carried it around with her for 17 days after it passed. That's over a thousand miles in mourning, um, which is amazing. But of course, orcas don't just mourn. They also have demonstrated a ton of other emotions, like a sense of humor and mischievousness and love. And they actually have a whole section of their brain that's dedicated to emotion. It's called the paralimbic cleft. And scientists actually don't really fully understand um, what it is. All they know is that it's meant for processing emotions. And in fact, orcas have the largest proportion of their brain dedicated to emotional processing than any other animal on the planet, which is so cool, in my opinion. OK, speaking of brains, there's been a bunch of back and forth on this one. Are orcas really that smart? So. Um, they have these really large brains, but some people, some researchers, have postulated that that's just for like temperature regulation. But, right? Wow. A study that came out in 2017, so super recently, by a guy named Alejandro Chimea Manrique de Lara, who has a PhD in complex system physics, um, has this compelling mathematically driven hypothesis that suggests that orcas are in fact intelligent as fuck. And so it's a super complicated study. But it basically shows that there are two mathematical routes that brains can take to get to a certain level of intelligence. And humans have taken the first route, and we thought that that was the only one. But he's shown that there is a second one um, that orca brains, given their descriptions, could have taken. And if, in fact, that is true, they have either the same level of intelligence of humans or, you know, possibly higher. I know. So badass equations aside, though, Orca brains are really freaking big. They weigh over six kilograms. That's like 15 pounds. That's a lot. We know from Jerry Maguire, that's a lot. Um, and they have the most gyrified brain on the planet. Again, like of all animals, the most gyrified. And you're thinking, what the hell is she talking about? Gyrification is how many wrinkles and folds a brain has. And the more wrinkles it is, the more data your brain can handle and the faster it can process things. And look at their cortical surface. I mean, it's like six times more than humans. They're really impressive animals. I, like, I don't know about you, but these numbers impress the crap out of me. OK, so another thing, I know I'm way over time, but hopefully you guys are enjoying this. I'm new. I'm new. <laughs> another thing that killer whale brains do is echolocation. Echolocation, as I'm sure you know, is the eminently cool ability to use sound and sound waves, in the case of orcas, clicks, to create a sound map of an animal's surroundings. Let me have a sip of this. And orcas are so damn good at echolocation that they can actually spot objects over a mile away. And since sound travels four times faster in water than it does in air, they're really speedy at it, too. And unlike light, sound can penetrate walls and objects. And at one time, a captive orca was observed acting a little defensively around its female trainer. And said trainer later realized, discovered, that she was pregnant. Some say coincidence. Others say echolocation-induced intuition. <laughs> Science. Yeah. So here's the mystery. Come on, guys. Gee. I've been going a long time, haven't I? Yeah. So here's the mystery. Are orcas actually our water-bound counterparts? Because evolutionarily, cetaceans, which are the order that orcas belong to, they resulted from the re-adaptation to water by terrestrial species. So Delara, our PhD friend, says that cetaceans are the result of, quote, the most successful mammalian colonization of the aquatic environment. That sounds like human behavior to me. Um, and what's more, according to legends of a certain First Nations tribe, the first humans were actually killer whales who came ashore, transformed to land creatures, and then forgot to go back. Literally just forgot. They were having too much fun. Um, and that makes orcas our ancestors. 
And then other tribes believe orcas to be the underwater reincarnation of humans that have passed away, and not just any humans, but their chiefs. So when they see orcas offshore, it's like their past chiefs have come to say hello and watch over them. But here's the thing. Whether or not orcas are a spiritual brethren, it's high time we started treating them better. We need to release those that are imprisoned and clean up the environment for those that are in the wild. And what's really cool is that there is currently an, a movement afoot to bestow rights upon orcas. It's called the Non-Human Rights Project, and their mission is to change the legal status of some non-human animals, orcas included, from things to persons who possess fundamental rights like bodily integrity and liberty, which is pretty awesome. So, as I leave you pondering this mystery of just how linked humans and orcas are, I propose a toast to Granny, the deceased matriarch of J-Pod. And I like to imagine that as the chief of the killer whale tribes, when she died, she crossed back into the human realm and is now a gorgeous two-year-old somewhere out there waiting to grow up to become a badass orca activist. Yeah. To Granny. Yeah.